Welcome to this celebration of online worship with the community of Nativity Lutheran Church in Allentown. I'm Kim Ring, and it is a joy to be sharing in this worship experience with you. While we're not meeting together in this building, we continue to offer online opportunities to be in community through Zoom gatherings, our Facebook page, and our website. You can find us by entering Nativity Allentown. We continue to offer prayers for the world, for our neighbors, and for each other. Because this service is available to anyone online, we have chosen not to lift up the names of those in need of prayer, but we do encourage our members to actively use the prayer list available on our website. Today, Rachel brings us an announcement on behalf of Nativity's youth. Rachel. Good morning. Next Sunday, February 7th, is the annual Super Bowl of Caring, an event where youth across the country work to fight hunger and poverty. Our youth here at Nativity seek to contribute to this event each year by collecting donations from the congregation. Seeing as we can't collect in person this year, we are asking for those who would like to contribute to make a donation with your weekly offering envelopes. Please write Super Bowl of Caring on the other line of your envelope and designate the donation amount. The proceeds will be divided between the Allentown Ecumenical Food Bank and the ELCA World Hunger Fund. And now we invite you to prepare your hearts for worship. And now let us join in confession. Gracious God, we have sought you in high and holy places, yet we are ill-prepared to recognize your presence among the lowly and poor. We believe you are deeply complex and unknowable. However, we often overlook your obvious truths. You instruct us not to worry, but we're anxious about the unknown. We often miss the stark realities immediately in front of us. Turn us, incarnate God, by the simple wonders of your love to live a faithful life filled with hope and joy. Amen. Beloved, Jesus, whose light illuminates our defects and flaws, you died to bring us forgiveness for those flaws. And while we were yet sinners, while we yet break God's heart, Jesus Christ died for us. It is God who said, let your light shine, and it is God who makes us what no striving or religious practice can. It is God who gives us light, shining in our hearts that molds us into children of the light. In Jesus' name, amen.
As people, as a group, as a community of faith, we, we gather, gather in this place to listen, to, to speak, speak, to worship, to, to pray, to be with God, because we know it, it is, is out of God's authority, it is out of God's love that we live. Alleluia. Compassionate God, you gather the whole universe into your radiant presence and continually reveal your Son as our Savior. Bring wholeness to all that is broken and speak truth to us in our confusion, that all creation will see and know your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Hello, thanks for joining us. I bet you have one of these at home. You might even have one of these close by you right now. Well, this one in particular controls our TV. Uh, but you know, I wonder, do you think it could control you? Uh, let's try it out. So I'm gonna push a button on here and then you act out the scene at home, okay? Uh, so let's, let's start with an easy one. Power on. Okay, did you get up and move around? Great. How about next we go to play? That sounds like a fun one. Okay, next, I bet your parents are gonna like this one. Volume up, volume up, volume up! All right, turn it back down, volume back down. Uh, how about pause? Did you freeze where you are? Great. What would happen if I changed the channel? Did you do something different there? All right, good job. And, oh, here's a fun one. Let's do slow motion. All right, let's finish it off with one just for your parents. Let's try mute. All right, great job, everybody. In our Bible lesson today, Jesus showed people his amazing control of everything around him. On the Sabbath day, Jesus went to the synagogue and began to teach. There was a man there who was possessed by an evil spirit. When Jesus went near him, the man cried out, What do you want with us, Jesus? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are. You are the Holy One of God. Then Jesus said, Be quiet. Then he spoke to the evil spirit, Come out. Do you know what happened? The evil spirit did exactly what Jesus commanded. It came out of the man. The Bible tells us that people were amazed. They looked at one another and asked, What's going on here? Even evil spirits obey his orders. There was power in the words that Jesus spoke that day. On that day, Jesus came in and took control of the life of that man. His life would never be the same. Jesus wants you to put control of your life in his hands. He wants to be in control because he wants what is best for you. The Bible tells us that God has a plan for us. It is a good plan that will give us hope and a bright future, but we will never see that plan work unless we allow Jesus to be in control. Let's close with a word of prayer. Dear God, we want Jesus to be in control of our life. We know that he wants what is best for us, and that's what we want too. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The first lesson is from Deuteronomy chapter 18, verses 15 through 20. Today's reading is part of a longer discourse in Deuteronomy, an updating of the law for the Israelite community as the people wait to enter the promised land. Here Moses assures the people that God will continue to guide them through prophets who will proclaim the divine word. A reading from Deuteronomy. Moses said, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own people. You shall heed such a prophet. This is what you requested of the Lord your God at Horeb on the day of the assembly, when you said, 
If I hear the voice of the Lord my God any more, or ever again, see this great fire, I will die. Then the Lord replied to me, They are right in what they have said. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their own people. I will put my words in the mouth of the prophet, who shall speak to them everything that I command. Anyone who does not heed the words that the prophet shall speak in my name, I myself will hold accountable. But any prophet who speaks in the name of other gods, or who presumes to speak in my name a word that I have not commanded, the prophet to speak, that prophet shall die. Word of God, word of life, thanks be to God. The second lesson is from 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 1-13. through 13. Paul is concerned about the way some Corinthian Christians use their freedom in Christ as a license to engage in non-Christian behavior that sets a damaging example to other impressionable believers. Christians have a responsibility to each other that their behavior does not cause another to sin. A reading from 1 Corinthians. Now concerning food sacrificed to idols, we know that all of us possess knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. Anyone who claims to know something does not yet have the necessary knowledge, but anyone who loves God is known by him. Hence, as to the eating of food offered to idols, we know that no idol in the world really exists, and that there is no God but one. Indeed, even though there may be so-called gods in heaven or on earth, as in fact there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is one God, the Father, from whom all things and for whom we exist, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all are all things and through whom we exist. It is not everyone, however, who has this knowledge, since some have been so accustomed to idols until now. They still think of the food they eat as food offered to an idol, and their conscience, being weak, is defiled. Food will not bring us close to God. We are no worse off if we do not eat, and no better off if we do. But take care that this liberty of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For if others see you, who possess knowledge, eating in the temple of an idol, might they not, since their conscience is weak, be encouraged to point of eating food sacrificed to idols? So by your knowledge those weak believers for whom Christ died are destroyed, but when you thus sin against members of your family, and wound their conscience, when it is weak, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if food is a cause of their failing, I will never eat meat, so that I may not cause one of them to fall. Word of God, word of life, thanks be to God. The Gospel according to St. Mark, the first chapter beginning with the 21st verse. They went to the Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, Jesus entered the synagogue and taught. They were astounded at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority, and not as the scribes. Just then there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, what have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing him and crying with a loud voice, came out of him. They were all amazed. And they kept on asking each other, What is this? A new teaching with authority. Jesus commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. At once his fame began to grow and spread throughout the surrounding territory of Galilee. The Gospel of the Lord. Good morning. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. This morning, I'd like to consider our first reading from the book of Deuteronomy. It seems to me that this text makes an important point for us. 
And that is that God promises to provide his people with a prophet to speak God's word and to mediate their relationship. If I asked you this morning to picture a prophet, I expect that your image would look something like this picture I took in Regensburg, Germany. With our postmodern sensibilities, we do not much care for prophets or for the judgment of God they proclaim. To be honest, we no longer fear God. Sometimes I think we see God more as Morgan Freeman turning the reins over to Jim Carrey. But when we diminish God and God's prophets as eccentrics or troublemakers, we diminish their importance to our society. To diminish the prophet is to make him or her easier to ridicule or ignore. But honestly, the prophetic tradition is one of the most valuable contributions the Hebrew religion has made to us. It traces its ancestry back to those times when a fearful people asked God for a mediator and God Moses. For a long time, it seemed like Moses would be the only prophet. But in today's scripture, we read his farewell speech, or at least part of it. The people are about to enter Canaan without Moses. In his address, Moses prepares the way for others to come after him on the assumption that the people will still need an encouraging and prodding mediator between themselves and God. And so in the scriptures, true prophets do not speak on their own behalf. They speak for God, saying, thus says the Lord, It would be important for us to be mindful of the fact that in Moses' day, there was no priesthood to speak of, no holy rite, no temple. And yet God called prophets to the Israelites. And they had one among them who spoke for God. Even as the nation took shape and became a settled people, this prophetic heritage was never forgotten. Of course, in time, various kings hired their own professional court prophets. These were folks who very often said what the king wanted to hear. Let's face it, that's what they were paid to do. But don't our modern leaders do the same thing? Not many critical voices are heard close to presidents, rulers, or other heads of state. But the great prophets of the scriptures were not professionals. They're calling to their prophetic task rose out of their faith in God. It also was fed strongly by a genuine concern for the welfare of the people and for the nation. To be honest, prophets were rarely popular. Nathan the prophet, for example, risked his life when he confronted King David about his adulterous affair with Bathsheba and his murdering of her husband, Uriah. King Ahab called Elijah the prophet, you troubler of Israel. And Jeremiah was confined at the bottom of a well because Many wished him to be silent. 
Even Jesus himself referred to the persecution and killing of the prophets. So the people and their leaders killed the messengers to stop the message. However, it didn't work. They could not stop God from calling other prophets. And at least some of the people recognized that God spoke through these men. Even when they didn't care for the message, they understood it was the voice of God coming to them. In our day and age, it is a part of our calling as a Christian to be a prophet. It was the Apostle Peter who reminded us and his people in his day, you are sons and daughters of the prophets. I happen to believe what the church has maintained for centuries, that God still calls special prophets from our midst. For example, on the 18th of January, Martin Luther King was commemorated. I believe he was a modern prophet. He was a prophet who died for delivering his message because it was unpopular, especially in the days when he proclaimed it. Being a prophet is not popular. Prophetic words and actions are unpopular because they call people to consider their sin and where it leads. But as followers of Jesus Christ, at least a part of our calling is to say unpopular things. It's part of our job description. Yet, even with that said, few Christian people these days will raise any questions at all about a religious-laden, pious, speech made by a politician. A politician whose church activity is tangential at best. It does not stop them from invoking religious phrases to support their partisan political ideas. And often they presume to set an agenda for the church, what the church ought and ought not to do. But the biblical tradition of being a prophet is that the church must never be the servant of political interests. And neither should the church's prof prophetic word reflect commonly accepted social behaviors. Our prophetic treatment of things around us must be free to be critical of both when it needs to be. A lot of churches are afraid to be prophetic. After all, it's not politically correct to call people out for their sins. On the other hand, there are a few denominations that are prophetic, at least on particular themes. And often they earn some respect from other church members or other churches. Let me illustrate. The Society of Friends and the Mennonites have consistently stood for peace and against war. And yet, as strong as their belief is, they never force it on others. Their pacifist stance causes others to consider that war 
It's too often used to resolve international conflicts. It seems too easy to go to war. Prophetic stands can be misunderstood, and they are often misunderstood. Some of the things we assume ought to be understood, ought to be accepted by everyone, are not. And to proclaim what seems obvious to us may sometimes turn out to be very prophetic indeed. Again, I'll illustrate. Some years ago, the art department of a Roman Catholic college in California was invited by a large multinational company to decorate its New York corporate office for Christmas. The only requirement was that the finished product needed to reflect the theme of Christmas. So the teachers and students went to New York, they measured the window space, they went back home and brainstormed and got busy with all kinds of ideas and drawings. After they decided what they were going to do, they hand-painted hundreds of folding cardboard boxes and they shipped them to New York for assembly in the windows. And a few of them traveled there and set them up. When the windows were finally unveiled and the display appeared to the passers-by, it simply read, Peace on Earth. The letters were large. They could be easily read from anywhere in the street, across the street, but moving closer to the display, to the windows, you could look at the finer print and it amounted to scores of quotations from internationally known people on the theme of peace. Just to illustrate a few, Pope John the 23rd, Martin Luther King Jr., Dag Hammarskjöld were all among them. This display was impressive and very well done and attractive. And the students and the faculty were pleased at what they had done. They gave this wealthy corporation a wonderful Christmas window at very little cost. but they were not prepared for what happened next. People walking by on the street were disturbed. There were no things in the window to look at. There were no lights or trees, only a cardboard wall proclaiming peace on earth. That's all, peace on earth. Many folks and other businesses wrote letters to the corporate office wondering what sort of subversive political message was intended here. After receiving many letters, the corporation wrote the college and asked them this, what does peace on earth have to do with Christmas? Well, what does peace on earth have to do with Christmas? We're only a few weeks past Christmas. And I bet that for most of us, our decorations are stored away. The carols stopped. But the angelic message the song of peace on earth is still a prophetic word. It is a word of God to a war-weary world. Try saying that quickly. We are all prophets with a message so that the schemes of the Herods of this world 
will not ultimately succeed. To proclaim the word of God is our prophetic task as members of the Church of Jesus Christ. It's that simple. It's easy for us to be critical of a church that fails to be as prophetic as it should be. But let's not forget, we are the church. The church's prophetic task is our job. Remember what Peter said, we are sons and daughters of the prophets. Ours is an inheritance to proclaim God's word to a world that desperately needs to hear it. However, very often we assume the prophetic role of the church is someone else's job. But it's all of ours. There's one other thing to be mindful of here. Whenever we proclaim the word of God, we have to be in tune with God, but we also have to be in tune with the human need of the folks around us. Mark's gospel reminds us that in the beginning of Jesus' ministry, he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath and he began to teach. The people were amazed at his teaching. He taught them as one having authority. But part of that same story is that after Jesus left the synagogue, he went to Simon's house. And there he found Simon's mother-in-law in bed with a fever. He took her by the hand and lifted her up. Our prophetic words will only be effective if we remember to always lift people up. A prophet needs to understand the word of God as we find it in the scriptures, as we find it in the sacraments, and we need to apply that word to our contemporary life. The Word of God is not something we draw out of the blue. It is put in our mouths as a result of study, prayer, reflection, and discussion. To be prophetic, we need to see the big picture. We need to have a sense of history and a grasp of moral law and understanding that our choices bring about predictable results. Implicit in our Christian faith, we have the belief, the experience, that God still speaks to us. God does not always say what we want to hear, and we must never confuse our opinions for the will of God. But as people gathered as the Church of Jesus Christ, we need to cultivate a sensitive ear and a willingness to be open to God in every situation. Each generation needs prophets to speak the word of God and act in the name of God. So maybe upon reflection, most of all our culture needs a prophetic voice. Amen. May the peace of God that passes all human understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.
Christ made known to the nations, let us offer our prayers for the church, the world, and all people in need. For all who share the gospel and proclaim freedom in Christ throughout the world, prophets, teachers, pastors, deacons, and lay leaders, for the church and its ministries, let us pray. Have mercy, O God. For all God's works in creation, plants and animals, water and soil, forests and farms, and for those tasked with protecting our natural resources and all that exists, let us pray. Have mercy, O God. For government and leaders, cities and nations, rescue professionals and legal aid attorneys, elected officials and grassroots organizers, for all responsible for the well-being of civil society, let us pray. Have mercy, O God. For those who suffer in mind, body, or spirit, those who are sick and hospitalized, those living with HIV or AIDS, those struggling with mental illness, those who are hungry or homeless, and all in any need, especially those we name before you now. For caregivers, hospice workers, and home health aides, let us pray. Have mercy, O God. For the concerns of this congregation, those who travel, those absent from worship, those celebrating birthdays or anniversaries, for the people of God in this place, and for other needs in our community, let us pray. Have mercy, O God. He, for the covenant God made with us in the waters of baptism, and thanksgiving for the baptized who have died in the Lord, let us pray. Have mercy, O God. Merciful God, hear the prayers of your people, spoken or silent, for the sake of the one who dwells among us, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Amen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time and trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. And now may God the Creator strengthen you, Jesus the Beloved fill you, and the Holy Spirit the Comforter keep you in peace. Amen.